but today I'm going to be talking about a collaboration that we have going between the uh, Ospers Petroleum Chemistry Laboratory, the Natural Resources Damage Assessment Unit, the University of California Davis's Marine Pollution Studies Laboratory at Granite Canyon, and NOAA's Montlake Laboratory in Seattle, Washington, specifically their Environmental Chemistry Group. So when an oil spill occurs, one of the most toxic components of concern are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, also called PAHs. And it's common for PAHs to be monitored in the tissues of exposed aquatic organisms following a spill. But many organisms have the capability of metabolizing these compounds. So it's important to not only monitor for the parent compounds, but also the metabolites as well. But we don't want to just be able to know the concentrations of metabolites. We want to be able to try to understand what those levels mean in terms of injury. And if we know injury, then we can uh, use that information in a natural resources damage assessment following the spill. So the overall goal of this project is to be able to link PAH metabolite levels in fish bile with injury in a dose response manner. So just a little background on PAHs. So PAHs are a class of hydrocarbon compound. They're characterized by having two or more fused benzene rings. In general, the class of compounds is characterized by having low water solubility and low volatility at room temperature. But in general, the smaller PAHs are going to be more soluble and more volatile relative to the larger PAHs. And these two properties, solubility and volatility, will uh, ultimately dictate how these compounds move and behave in the environment following a spill. These ring structures can also have carbon substituents attached to them. So they can have ranging from one to four different carbon units attached to the ring structure. And we call these alkylated PAHs. Also in terms of metabolism, the metabolites that we're looking for are these ring structures with oxygen atoms attached to them. And we'll talk a little bit more about these specific metabolites and their structures uh, coming up. So why are PAHs of concern? So PAHs are considered, considered moderately persistent in the environment and can bioaccumulate. They're known to have moderate to high acute toxicity to aquatic life and birds. They in general, larger PAHs are more toxic than smaller PAHs, but the smaller PAHs are not without toxicity. They're known to be carcinogenic, and they can cause cellular damage, developmental abnormalities. They can elicit biochemical responses, as well as uh, result in decreased survival in fish and birds. And PAHs are of concern as a result um, in terms of fish consumption following a spill. So a fishery could be closed following a spill in order to protect uh, people from eating contaminated fish. So it's important to understand uh, pH levels following a spill as a result of a fishery closure. So as I mentioned, different organisms have the capability of metabolizing these compounds. So why not just monitor for parent pHs? So vertebrates have a high capacity to met metabolize pHs where crustaceans have a medium capacity and bivalves have a low capacity. So bivalves are often used as a sentinel species following a spill to monitor PAH residues. Um, but in terms of fish or vertebrates that have the high capacity to metabolize these compounds, um, it's important to look for the PAH metabolites in order to confirm PAH, PAH exposure as the parent levels decrease following the spill, but the metabolite levels will be increasing. So if we know metabolite levels, that's a good way to provide a a direct piece of evidence that exposure has occurred. And this is a widely accepted practice in European monitoring programs to look for PAH metabolites. So again, we can demonstrate exposure by knowing metabolite levels, but can we tie this to an injury that can be used in a natural resources damage assessment? And this is what we're um, trying to get at. So now to give you just a little bit of background on PAH metabolism. So the overall goal of metabolism is to um, increase the water solubility of a compound such that it could be excreted from an organism. So PAHs are um, metabolized in various tissues, but mainly in the liver, and they are metabolized using specific enzymes, uh, P450 mixed function oxygenases. And what happens is that the ring structure ultimately becomes oxidized. And so this top middle structure I have is an epoxide intermediate. And then this 
uh, this structure can then be protonated to form single hydroxylated products, which are the two structures in the bottom left-hand corner where we have an OH group attached to the ring structure. So these are what we call hydroxylated products. We can also form a ring structure that has two hydroxyl groups on it, such as in the top right-hand corner of the picture, and we call this a diol. So that epoxide underwent another oxidation reaction in order to, to add two hydroxyl groups onto that ring structure. The, and this is what we call a diol. The diol can undergo further oxidation using P450 enzymes to form the diol epoxide product, which is shown in the bottom right-hand corner. And this, this particular metabolite uh, can form DNA adducts, so it can bind to the DNA and prevent replication or disrupt replication leading to a carcinogenic effect. Um, so this is a, a metabolite that's often talked about. But just in general, this is just a suite of phase, indeed we call these particular hydroxylated metabolites phase one metabolites, and this is, they are products of what we call phase one metabolism. So once phase one metabolism occurs, we've generated these hydroxylated ring structures, and then we go on to what we call phase two metabolism. And so this is where we use specific enzymes to attach large water-soluble molecules at the hydroxyl position on those phase one metabolites. And so we're highlighting, I'm highlighting two different reactions on this slide. And these are ones that we are, uh, that are important for uh, fish. And so the phase two metabolites that are formed are the conjugated glucuronide metabolite, as well as, which is in the top right, and then the conjugated sulfate metabolite, which is in the, um, the bottom right. And again, these are a product of very specific enzymes that will attach that glucuronide molecule to that hydroxyl functional group on the ring structure. And then the sulfate group, again, is used using a, the sulfate gets attached by using a very specific enzyme uh, to attach that sulfate group at that hydroxyl position. And once, and we call these two conjugate uh, metabolites, phase two, con, phase two metabolites, and then now the, the PAHs are rendered water soluble enough that they could be excreted out of the organism into the bile. So the other thing to note that these reactions are reversible. So we have the arrows going in two different directions. So if we add a specific enzyme such as glucuronidase to the phase two metabolite, we will cleave off that glucuronide molecule rendering back that single hydroxylated product so we can go back and forth between phase one and phase two metabolites using specific enzymes. And this is important for how we ultimately prepare our samples for looking for various uh, metabolites in the bile. So the bile samples that we are going to be working with are going to have a combination of both these phase one and phase two metabolites. So our sample preparation procedure that we're using is based on the NOAA procedure. So they have extensive experience and they've been working on pH metabolite method development for many years and so they're quite a bit further ahead um, of us at the petroleum chemistry lab in terms of measuring pH metabolite so we're really piggybacking on the work that they've already done so their protocol requires adding glucuronidase and sulfatase those two specific enzymes to our bile in order to hydrolyze those phase two conjugates so that everything we're going to be measuring in the bile is going to be looked at as a phase one metabolite. Both of our laboratories are going to be analyzing the bile sample in order to compare our methods. So we're both running um, using LC uh, tandem mass, spec mass spectrometry to identify and quantify these phase one metabolites. So part of this, another component of this project is an interlaboratory comparison study where the PCL protocol, which is based on the NOAA method, that we're going to be comparing our method performance in terms of um, recoveries and of these, of these specific metabolites. So as I mentioned, the petroleum lab is kind of in their infancy in developing our method and our analyte list. So our instrument is looking for single hydroxylated products, so just the ring structures that have one OH group attached to it that, that you can see in this bottom left-hand corner. 
the NOAA protocol, they are measuring their analyte list has over 50 different metabolites that they're looking for. So they're really the gold standard of um, the pH metabolite uh, methodology in terms of analyzing specifically by LCM SMS. So their protocol, their target list includes both these single hydroxylated metabolites as well as the diol, as well as the alkylated and hydroxylated PAHs, where I'm showing you a representative structure here on the slide. So now that we've talked about PAHs, why they're important um, to monitor for, and about the metabolites as well, now we're going to get into the exposure studies that we are going to be trying to, um, that we're going to be using to try to relate biometabolite levels to injury. So our exposure organism that we're going to be using are top smelt. And this species is common in California estuaries and marine waters. And our collaborators at Granite Canyon have conducted many crude oil bioassays in the past using top smelt. So they have experience taking care of these organisms in the laboratory and working with them. And they went out to Elkhorn Slough um, to collect a whole bunch of top smelt and the cohort that they collected is shown in this photograph um, in the green tank. So top smelt is the exposure organism that we're going to be working with and now I'll talk to you about what we're going to be exposing them to. So we are going to be exposing to the, exposing them to what we call a high energy water accommodated fraction of crude oil and that high energy water accommodated fraction is abbreviated HEWOF. So I'll be referring to HEWOF. So all HEWOF is, is a mixture of oil and seawater, and that we are mixing oil, crude oil, that we have sourced from Platform Irene, which is a pro oil production platform in the Santa Barbara Channel. And the oil was collected from a pipeline um, after it brings the oil onto shore. So not actually at the pipe, not actually at the platform, but at the pipeline that's come on shore. Um, from Platform Irene. And so we're going to take a weight amount, uh, a known weight amount of oil. Specifically, we're going to be mixing one gram of oil per liter of seawater in a blender. So in these photos, I, I'm showing you a uh, how we fill the syringe with uh, crude oil. We weigh that syringe to know the, the mass of oil in there. And then we add it to a blender that has a known amount of seawater. And then we're going to turn on this blender at low for 30 seconds uh, to blend up this oil water mixture. And that's how we prepare. That's what we call HEWOF. And so the idea of preparing this in a blender is that we are trying to simulate surf zone mixing. So following a spill, that oil would be in the, could be in the surf zone. And so we're trying to incorporate as much a representative amount of oil um, into that seawater relative to trying to get at a surf zone mixing environment. So we prepare multiple batches of this HEWOF in the blender and we add, after each preparation batch, we pour that into a 23 liter carboy and we prepare enough batches to fill that carboy. And so for our exposures that we're going to be doing, we need one carboy per uh, aquarium that we're going to be using for our exposures. So we have three aquaria that we're going to be using. So uh, for three replicate uh, concentrations or three replicate tanks. And so we're going to need three carboys in order to fill those three aquaria. And you can see those shown here. And then this last slide on the right is just showing you an up close picture of um, the oily water once it's the oily uh, water once it's in the, the aquaria. So once we get those, we, we want to get the fish in that HEWA and start um, seeing what we can see. So the objectives of our first range finding experiment is to expose top smelt at a one gram per liter HEWAS under static conditions for 72 hours with aeration. And we wanna be able to see uh, if our analytical method is sensitive enough to uh, see pH metabolites in the bile following this exposure. So we just wanna see what we can see. And then we wanna assess the use of swim speed as a behavioral endpoint following the exposure. Our experimental design is shown here. So we're doing a 72 hour exposure. Our first treatment is this one gram per liter platform Irene crude oil HEWA, and we have three replicate tanks. 
and we have 10 fish per tank. And then we're also running a seawater control side by side, again, with three replicate tanks, 10 fish per tank. And at the start and the finish of the exposure period, we will be measuring 45 different PAHs in the water. And we sum those 45 PAHs and we call that PAH 45. And then we also measure both diesel and motor oil range total petroleum hydrocarbons in the water um, at the start and the finish of the exposure period. And this is to characterize our exposure media over the course of the experiment. At the end of the 72 hour duration, we will do our behavioral assessment where we record five fish per replicate. And then we do that. We record five fish per replicate, five minutes of an individual, and then five minutes together. And our uh, recording setup is shown here. So we have a tank with uh, fresh sea water in it, and we have a video camera mounted looking down into the tank. And so we'll be recording your behavior um, under the conditions I mentioned previously. And then at the end of the behavioral assessment, we will euthanize the fish, we weigh and measure them, and then we dissect them to remove the gallbladder. And the gallbladder is shown here, and the gallbladder is what contains the bile. So you can see they're pretty small. It looks like this little green emerald down in the right-hand corner. And then we're going to drain the contents of the gallbladders into a small vial. And we composite all the, um, all the bile by replicate. So each vial that we collect is going to be, have um, represent 10 different fish. So we'll, we'll composite each of the composites of bile by the replicate. Once we have um, all the bile by replicate in the vial, that vial will be split for between two different laboratories, the PTO and the NOAA laboratory for PAH metabolite analysis. So here are the results of our water chemistry from this first experiment. So after the 72 hours, um, well, basically, so the, the picture shown here is gonna tell you um, what the chemistry data is also telling us. So day zero control is nice and clean. Day zero, our heat wash is nice and brown, but by day three, our heat wash is looking pretty clear and you can see some oil droplets have coalesced on the inside of the tank. And so what this is showing from our chemistry is that we lost 76% of our PAH 45 over the 72 hour uh, exposure period. We lost 65% of our diesel range TPH and 12% of our motor oil, motor oil range TPH. So we lost quite a bit of our exposure concentration over the course of the experiment. In terms of our behavioral assessment, so we didn't observe any mortality over the expo exposure period and then there were no obvious changes in swimming behavior between the treatments or controls over the course of the experiment. So um, we didn't really see anything in terms of behavioral changes, but what we did see were PAH metabolites. So this top graph is showing you the PAH metabolite profile uh, in the bile that was measured by the NOAA laboratory. So this is a suite of over 50 different PAH metabolites, and the height of the bar is showing you is relative to the concentration of each of these metabolites in the bile. So the most abundant metabolites that we saw were alkylated and hydroxylated dibenzothiophenes. We also saw metabolites of fluorines, phenanthrenes, and fluoranthines, as well as lower levels of naphthalene-related metabolites. If we look at the PAHs in the water over the exposure pe period. So this is the bottom graph is showing us the pH concentrations in the water or as, it's actually the percent pH 45 in the water over the course of the experiment. And so what we see is that in the water, the naphthalenes were the most abundant pHs in the water, but this did not translate to naphthalene metabolites being the most abundant metabolites in the bile. So this was interesting. In terms of the comparison of our sample results between the petroleum lab and the NOAA laboratory for overlapping target analytes, so those analytes that we have in common, so basically hydroxylated naphthalenes, fluorines, and phenanthrenes, what we find is that we found very similar agreement between our analytes that we have in common for these first, uh, this first set of samples that we analyzed. 
So what our takeaways from this very first exposure experiment was that because we lost so much of our exposure concentration over the course of the experiment, um, we need to ultimately add fresh HEWOF every day to those aquaria in order to increase that exposure concentration over the duration of the, the treatment. So we need to perform a daily renewal of that HEWOF in order to increase the exposure to volatiles and oil droplets. Also, PAH metabolite level, levels measured in the treatment and controls confirmed exposure despite the lack of obvious change in swim behavior. So we were able to see metabolites even though we didn't, um, we couldn't detect any kind of um, behavioral change. And our other finding was that the petroleum lab and the NOAA methods for analytes in common did produce similar results for the PAH metabolite measurements. So knowing what we learn from our first range finding experiment, we set up a second range finding experiment where we did, we repeated that treatment that we just did, but we are performing a daily renewal of the HEWOF at that same one gram per liter concentration in order to increase that exposure concentration. This time we added a, an additional treatment using weathered oil HEWOF. So prior to preparing the HEWOF, we weathered the oil by heating it up to to drive off a lot of the compounds that we lost over the course of the experiment. And so the idea behind this was we were trying to stabilize the pH concentration in the water in order for us to try to get away from having to prepare HEWOF every day. So it's a very labor intensive process. We were preparing a lot of HEWOF, so you have to deal with all of that as waste following the exposure period. So this second treatment of trying to use weathered oil HEWOF um, was really trying to get at, do we really have to make fresh HEWOF every day over the course of the experiment? So that was our second treatment in this uh, second round of exposures. And then this time we also wanted to assess the use of a startle response as a behavioral endpoint for these exposures. Our experimental design is shown here for our 72 hour duration exposure. So the top treatment, the one gram per liter HEWOF with a daily renewal, three replicate tanks, 10 fish per tank. Our second treatment was the weathered oil HEWOF, where again, we had three replicate tanks, 10 fish per tank, and this again was not doing a daily renewal. So trying to get at, do we really have to make fresh HEWOF every day? And then we, again, we had a seawater control, and then we performed the same chemistry measurements pH 45 and diesel and motor oil range TPH at the start and the finish of the exposure um, period in order to characterize our exposure media. After the 72 hour exposure, we did our behavioral assessment where we, we recorded five fish per replicate, five minutes as an individual and then five minutes together. And then after three minutes, we applied a noise to the tank for seven times at five second intervals. And then the videos that were recorded of this behavior, uh, software was used to track the swim velocity and distance uh, travel to characterize that startle. At the end of the behavioral assessment, again, we euthanized the fish, we weighed and measured them. This time we, we photographed and examined them for external lesions. We composited the, the livers by replicate. Uh, we also uh, removed, saved the heads with the gills in formalin for histopathology by replicate. We removed the gallbladders and then we uh, composite, again composited the bile from, from 10 replicate, uh, all 10 replicate fish into one vial. And then we split the, the vial for PAH metabolite analysis by the Petroleum Chemistry Lab as well as the NOAA laboratory. So the water chemistry results of this second experiment. So this time in our doing the daily renewal treatment, we lost 29% of our pH 45 compared to 76% in the previous experiment. So without daily renewal. So this time we were able to keep our exposure concentration up by doing that daily renewal. We only lost 34% um, of our diesel range TPH and then we pretty much didn't lose anything in our motor oil range TPH. In terms of our weathered HEWOF treatment, what we were trying to get at, do we really have to make fresh HEWOF? And the conclusion is yes, you do. So we lost 87% of our PAH45 and our weathered HEWOF without the renewal. 
Um, the other thing to note is that the starting concentration of the PAH 45 was pretty low, was about 65 parts per billion um, at day zero relative to 277 parts per billion at day zero when we use that fresh oil to prepare HEWOC. So that weather oil had quite a bit lower starting concentration of PAHs. And then ultimately by the end, we lost 87% of it anyway. So need to make fresh HEWOC. In terms of our behavioral endpoints, this time in our daily renewal treatment, we saw mortality and lesions of, uh, were observed. We didn't see any of these uh, effects in the control or the weather treatments. We lost the, the majority of the mortality in our daily renewal treatment occurred um, at the 72 hour mark. And so by this time we had lost almost 57% of our fish in that treatment. So definitely saw behavioral effects in that daily renewal treatment. And then the slide on the bottom can show, is showing you the reddening of this on the snout area of the fish in that daily renewal treatment. In terms of the startle response, so this is, again is based on the average speed and distance traveled following the application of that uh, stimuli or the noise. And so what we found was that the the fish in the daily renewal treatment, they um, their speed was lower as well as they did not travel as far um, relative to the control and weather treatment. So their ability to startle or to respond to that stimuli was decreased as a result of the exposure. So this is considered an injurious effect that um, possibly they can't get away from predators um, as a result of being ex exposed under these conditions. Again, we did see metabolites and the this is the metabolite profile again that was measured by the NOAA laboratory. So the red bars are showing you the daily renewal treatment. The green bars are showing you that same treatment but without renewal. And then the orange bars are showing you the weathered uh, the weather treatment levels. And so what we see is that the metabolite levels were the highest when under that daily renewal condition. So as they so this translates into the higher the exposure concentration, the higher levels of metabolites that we see. The other thing to point out is that Regardless of the treatment, we see the same metabolite, so the profile doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the levels of metabolites based on that increase, um, the different levels of exposure concentrations in each of those uh, treatments. If we look at just focus on the metabolite profile for our daily renewal treatment, again, what we see is that the alkylated and hydroxylated dibenzothiazines were the most abundant metabolites. Uh, we also saw, again, fluorine, phenanthrene, and fluoranthine metabolites, as well as lower levels of naphthalene metabolites. If we look at the most abundant PAHs in the water, which is shown on the bottom graph here, we see that the naphthalene PAHs are the most abundant uh, PAHs in the water over the exposure period, but this does not translate into PA, the naphthalene being the most abundant metabolites in the bile following the exposure. When we compare the uh, sample, re sample results from the second round of treatments, what we see is on this graph I'm showing you, the first three samples are the control samples, the middle three samples are our daily renewal samples, and then our, the, the last three samples are the bile results from the weather treatment. And again, these are only for analytes that our two labs have in common. And we see that for the first two replicates of the daily renewal treatment, so the two largest bar graphs, we see um, we did see some differences in the hydroxylated naphthalene level metabolites for these two samples. Um, but if we look at that third replicate for our daily renewal treatment, you notice that it's a it's a lot lower than the first two replicates, and this is actually from bile that was collected from dead fish. So where the first two samples, two replicates for our unweathered treatment 
with the daily renewal. Those are from live fish or bile collected from live fish. And so what's of interest is that, or what's of note is that the metabolite levels are for the dead fish bile, they're higher than the controls, but they're a lot lower um, than in the live fish. And then if we look at the weathered results, we see um, we did see some differences in the in the fluorine results, but in general, um, we saw better agreement in these three replicates for the weathered treatment. So conclusions from this second experiment were that thibenzoxyphenes had the highest metabolite concentration, even though it wasn't the highest percent composition in the heat loss. Um, also, weathering didn't dramatically change the metabolite profile, so we didn't Regardless of the treatment that we did, we saw the same metabolites. The big difference differences were in the, the levels of the metabolites, and that's due to higher exposure concentration were leading to higher levels of metabolites. Um, also, biometabolite levels remained high, even though pH levels in the water were low, confirming that metabolites are a good indicator of long-term exposure, and that dead fish bile, while higher than controls, um, did contain less metabolite than live fish. So our next steps, what we want to do is we really want to try to get at the dose response relationship between the metabolite levels and injury. So what we're going to do is we're going to perform two additional unweathered daily renewal treatments at 0.5 and 0.25 grams per liter HEWAS. The work that we already did, we performed, we did our exposure at one gram per liter HEWAF, we found the, um, how to set up the experiment, basically do a daily renewal in order to start seeing an injury. And we know we can see metabolite, um, metabolite levels um, on our instrument. So um, now that we've kind of set that upper um, threshold, now we want to try to see, do um, repeat the exposures at two different concentrations and see if we can get at that dose response relationship. And then we're also going to be conducting histopathology on the brain tissue that was collected from the second exposure study. And with that, I would like to thank all of my collaborators. So big thank you to Regina Donahoe um, from the NRDA group for helping me get this project off the ground. Uh, a really big thank you to April Da Silva. She is um, really in charge of the, uh, uh, doing the behavioral assessments for this study. So in terms of processing all the videos and um, really helping us try to tease out um, injury uh, using these exposures. So uh, big thank you to April. Also, big thank you to our collaborators at Granite Canyon, uh, Bryn, Katie, and Jen for um, setting up these exposures. And um, it's really labor intensive and it's a, it's, it's a messy job. So um, thank you to Granite Canyon folks for um, setting up the exposure studies and taking them down for us. And then also really big thank you to Dennis Silva and Gina Ucalo um, from the NOAA Laboratory for their real generosity in sharing their, um, their knowledge and experience and methodologies for helping the petroleum lab um, get up to speed in terms of measuring pH metabolites and really allowing us to um, kind of just ride a little bit on their coattails to help us uh, set up and develop our method. But um, without them, this work would be a lot less interesting. As you can tell, they have um, their suite of metabolites they're measuring is, is really broad. And this study is the first time they, they're reporting the alkylated metabolites. So we're very fortunate that they were able to come online with that in time for this particular work. So um, then I also like to thank the folks at the Petroleum Chemistry Laboratory, Sarah Kelly Gadbury, for um, performing the metabolite measurements for us and uh, also the TPH measurements. And then uh, so Lakai for uh, doing the PAH measurements in the water for us. So thank you, everybody. And that will do it.